Okay, we are uh, reconvening as the health health House Health Care Committee. It's uh, about 1.40 p.m. on Wednesday, April 21st. And we are convening this afternoon to uh, hear from our Legislative Council, Jennifer Carby, about some, and this is in anticipation of possible language changes to a bill that we passed out and is now in the Senate and is in the jurisdiction of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. But at the request of their chair, Senator Lyons, uh, we are reviewing language in anticipation of possible changes that they, make, they, they may make at the recommendation of our legislative council. So with that, and this is with regard to House Bill 430. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Legislative Council, Jen Carby. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So we are looking at um, some new potential language for H430, which is um, what we'd call the Dr. Dinosaur Expansion Bill. Uh, and just by way of a little bit of background, so Diva had asked to work on some new language. I worked on this language with them. Um, they were concerned that the way the bill had been written um, to kind of tie into the Dr. Dinosaur, existing Dr. Dinosaur program would require them to make eligibility, Medicaid eligibility determinations for all of these individuals, then find them ineligible based on their immigration status, and then find them um, eligible for this coverage. And so knowing that the committee had wanted to make things, make it a, a more streamlined process for people who were uh, not eligible for, even though they were financially eligible, were not eligible for Dr. Dinosaur uh, because of their immigration status to have a, a easier path into the program. And so that is the language that I have worked with them on for um, H430. It's a new first section and then some conforming changes throughout. I did do a walkthrough of this language with the Senate Health and Welfare Committee this morning, and they had a couple of additional provisions they were interested in. I'm still working those out with Diva, but I, I will tell you what they are when, uh, when we get there. So I will put the language up. Now I would just remind members that, again, we were operating under the pressure of crossover. So we were aware that there might be something that should be looked at further, but it was important to move the bill forward. And I appreciate Jen, you uh, engaging with Diva in the interim. So thank yes, you. Yes, and they were, they were great. You're very welcome. Uh, so the first thing, this, so this re would replace the existing section one. And the first thing that it would do would actually codify it elsewhere in the statutes to take it out of the Medicaid subchapter and put it in its own subchapter in the same overall chapter in Title 33. So it had a new subchapter that I've called coverage for additional populations, um, but it was a, a good sort of neutral um, heading that we could potentially put other things in in the future if it seemed appropriate. So planning ahead. Um, so this would add a new section 2091, it's just a, a different section number, and I've called it Dr. Dinosaur-like coverage for certain Vermont residents. Um, it's maybe not the most elegant, but I, I wanted to keep that idea of Dr. Dinosaur that I think had been important to this committee and to, to Vermonters who understand what the programs are, even though um, we, we can't really offer them exactly Dr. Dinosaur because of its connection to Medicaid and SCHIP, the federal programs. Um, so, and then I move away from using that term for the rest of it. So we have as used in this section, and this is our new term, instead of undocumented immigrants, we have uh, Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is unavailable. Um, so as used in this section, that term also includes, and you'd had this in your language, migrant workers who are employed in seasonal occupations in this state. Um, so then it directs the Agency of Human Services, instead of saying provide coverage under Dr. Dinosaur, or even like Dr. Dinosaur, it calls out the types of services that Dr. Dinosaur provides. Shall provide hospital, medical, dental, and prescription drug coverage to the following categories of Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available and who are otherwise uninsured. So this would be children under 19 years of age whose household income does not exceed 317% of the federal poverty level and pregnant individuals whose household income does not exceed 213% of the federal poverty level for coverage during their pregnancy and for 60 days postpartum. 
I'll stop here for a moment to say children under 19 years of age with household income up to 312% of the federal poverty level plus a 5% disregard, income disregard, is the eligibility criteria for children under Dr. Dinosaur. So that's what we're capturing here with the, the 312 plus 5% is the 317%. And pregnant individuals with household income that does not exceed 208% of the federal poverty level plus a 5% disregard. So that's where we have this 213% for coverage during their pregnancy and for 60 days postpartum. This is what is covered currently um, for people whose immigration status makes them eligible for the Dr. Dinosaur program. And then it would have uh, allowed the, doc the Agency of Human Services to adopt rules to carry out the purposes of the section, which we had before. And I'll, I'll talk about some new potential language for this after we walk through the rest. Section two still has that 1.4 million in one-time funds to the Agency of Human Services for grants or reimbursements or both to healthcare providers for delivering healthcare services during FY22 to children and pregnant individuals who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available. So you'll see here, I've shown in the yellow and you know, highlighting just what the changes are from the language that was in the bill that passed that came out of this committee and that passed the House. Um, so, so that's the language change there. Also grants to Vermont organizations that work with members of Vermont's undocumented immigrant community. That language still seemed like it, it fit to describe the community who, people, who these organizations work with. Uh, or with members of the healthcare provider community to provide outreach and information regarding opportunities for children and pregnant individuals in Vermont who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available to access healthcare services at, a low, at low or no cost in FY22 and thereafter. And I'll pause here just because it's in context. Um, the Health and Welfare Committee was interested in adding language right here in between provide and outreach that would say culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach and information. So that's what is likely going in um, the version that they're working on. And then we have this third use of that 1.4 million for implementing the technological and operational processes necessary for DIVA to administer. And again, we're describing this as the coverage for Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available as set forth in this newly recodified section beginning on July 1st, 2022. In section three, we have Agency of Human Services, Dr. Dinosaur-like coverage. This is just a session law provision around the FY23 estimate. It has AHS provide information on the estimated FY23 costs of providing coverage to Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available pursuant to that renumbered section beginning on July 1st, 22, as part of the agency's FY23 budget presentation to the relevant committees. And then in section four, we have the effective dates. So subsection A does not change. Subsection B, again, I've changed the language to uh, include the Agency of Human Services making coverage available to Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available in accordance with section one and that renumbered section beginning on July 1st, 22, subject to FY23 appropriations for this purpose. And then finally, I suggested a name change and it was pointed out in Senate Health and Welfare today that it really shouldn't be expanding eligibility, it should just be an act relating to eligibility for Dr. Dinosaur-like coverage for all income eligible children and pregnant individuals regardless of immigration status. So my kind of working new version has that language in it. Um, do you want me to stop there? Or do you want me to talk about the other potential change that uh, that is kind of in process right now? I'm, I'm gonna suggest you talk about all the changes. Okay, uh, that's so that then what I know. thought as well. The other concern that was raised in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee was around the confidentiality of information that was provided by applicants and enrollees and potential concerns about how that information might be used. Um, and so I'm working on coming up with some language what I have right now and what I've sent to DIVA for their comment but have not heard back because um, I wanna make sure we're not again, muddying the waters with the Medicaid 
language. I, I'm hoping to kind of piggyback on the existing Medicaid confidentiality pieces by saying something like the Agency of Human Services shall adhere to the same confidentiality provisions regarding applications and records as set forth in section 1902A of this chapter, except that the agency shall not make any information regarding applicants or enrollees available to the US government. Um, and then putting something sort of related to that over here in the uh, outreach and information about opportunities for accessing this coverage and the confidentiality, confidentiality of all information regarding applicants and enrollees. So that potentially part of that outreach and information would be here's this, this coverage is going to be available to you and you don't need to worry about the confidentiality of that information. And I just, uh, on that point, uh, am, am I correct? That you, this is similar to what was done when we created the stimulus funding uh, to somewhat similar population uh, to try to pr preserve uh, preserve confidentiality and lack and, and and reduce the fear that it would lead to some type of immigration consequence. That is what I have been told. I have not had an opportunity to review that language. I've been focused on the um, kind of AHS specific Medicaid enrollee confidentiality language. But I think that the idea is the same in that um, parallel was brought up in Senate Health and Welfare as part of this. Yeah, I think it, it might, I would just encourage you to perhaps at least take a yes, look at I'm that. Looking at that right now. There were some of those same concerns raised, of course, in that initiative earlier. Um, open it up for questions, Jen? Yes. Do you want me to take the language down or leave it up? What's most helpful? Uh, well, let's see. Let's, let's hear the question and see whether language is helpful or not. Uh, right. Representative Black? Uh, so I have a couple of questions. Thanks, Jen. Um, sure. So what happens if the federal poverty level changes for Dr. Dinosaur? This uh, would change with it. This wouldn't change with it absent legislative action. Um, the The... Dr. Dinosaur levels, um, eligibility levels, I don't believe are currently in statute, although language linking premiums to certain eligibility or uh, income categories is in statute. So we can't just put the income levels um, concurrent with current Dr. Dinosaur eligibility. The strong recommendation was really to separate this from an existing Medicaid financed program. Okay, and well, and the other thing in that same vein is the 60 days and coming up here, don't we have federal rules that that 60 days postpartum will be changing? Uh, there is an option for the states to pursue that I, as, as I'm, Remembering, I think it doesn't actually become a, a, um, an option that we can take advantage of until 2022, and then it's five potential for five years. So we may need to do something to address this population if that's the direction that, that things go. So I understand Diva wants this, but just changing the language to say all of these things consistent with with current programs is not appropriate so that we don't have to keep changing it? Um, I guess I'd prefer to have Diva weigh in on that. I didn't, that was not a specific question that I asked them. So I don't know what their response would be. Could, and, could we, can I just step in? Uh, could we ask that you at least raise that question, that specific question with Diva? Because yes. it, it seems like if there's a way, if that's not too much of a linkage for that that would address the questions that Representative Black is raising. And um, the I'm, I'm thrilled about the addition of um, culturally appropriate and language because if you guys if you all, if you all remember, um, we had that in the original, and then I believe when appropriations did their breakdown, they removed that. So I'm glad that will be going back in. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is, 
isn't there currently um, like driver's privileges cards that are given and wouldn't the, isn't there something in there also existing language that, so confidentiality regarding federal, mm -hmm. that, that was another thing. That was it. Can certainly take a look at that. I, I was just thinking maybe that would be a copy and paste. I'm not sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was it. I, I think it looks I think it looks good though. Okay. Um, Representative uh, Donahue and Representative Peterson. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I have another um, linkage question, but but maybe there's a different way to address it by language without lengthy. Um, when when we talk. Um, about the Agency of Human Services shall provide hospital, medical, dental, and prescription drug coverage to these categories. But we're no longer linked to Dr. Dinosaur, and there's no um, modifiers there, which um, could be read to be much more expansive than anything that Dr. Dinosaur covers. I, it just comes to mind, like dental, I know, is not an unlimited dental benefit. I think there may be some other things. So is there some way we can identify that we're intending to align it with the benefits that, uh, you know, that we can't say that Dr. Dinosaur provides, but um, some way to, um, to create that assumption without reproducing all of the Without saying, I mean, it's easy to say the income, we can't list all of the specific inclusions in, of Dr. Dinosaur um, in rule or whatever, but I think we need something to link that. I will, uh, again, I will ask Viva for their thoughts on that. Okay. Dave Peterson. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jen, I just want to ask about the confidentiality uh, part of it. Uh, and, and it's something I really don't understand in terms of um, the folks that are here and what their privileges um, allow them to do and to be in this country. I, I assume you would Anything we do, let's put it this way, anything we do would be in conformance to uh, federal and state law, I assume, correct? I, I you know, I, no. I don't know if you understand. Uh, no, I, I think you're just operating in a different sphere. You're not you're not addressing um, you're addressing immigration only to the in the sense that you're identifying particular individuals who may or categories of individuals who are not eligible for Medicaid because of their immigration status, but otherwise you are dealing with, with paying for health benefits. You're not um, taking a particular position on, on what they can and can't do as far as their immigration status. Right, right. Um, okay, I, I guess my, my concern is I, I I don't want to hide some folks that aren't supposed to be here. I guess that's that's the bottom line for me. I, you know, I and I don't know, I don't know much about it, but I, it, you know, we should be conforming conforming to the federal law anyway. I assume we're making our own law here, which is fine. But um, well, can I jump in here? And I'm not going to be as fully articulate probably as needed. But our one of the issues that has come up over the years as we've extended drivers, uh, what, what are they called? I, they're, they're not driver's licenses, but- they're uh, Driver's privilege cards or something like that. Driver's privilege cards. Uh, and um, we'll use that as a, as a good example. Um, there have been instances, and so the concern was, okay, how do we, how do we, how do we navigate this 
territory where we believe there, we Vermont decide, believe there should have the ability to have a driver's identification card or driver's privilege card because it gives them an identification. Uh, but there were instances in which the, there, may, there may be uh, and likely are some kind of federal rule or regulation saying that uh, information should be provided to the immigration service for anybody who might not be a documented citizen. And the policy decision is that Vermont is not going to participate in that for this purpose, uh, because otherwise no one would come forward to get the driver's privilege card. Uh, and in fact, there have been instances where the De Department of Motor Vehicles ha has adopted a policy, but um, individual members of the Department of Motor Vehicles actually participated in not notifying immigration and some people ended up being deported, which was completely contrary to what the policy of the state was. And I think the concern is similar here. I mean, there is, there is a tacit, I mean, I don't even know if I should say this on the record, but there's a tacit understanding that there are workers here who are working in our, particularly in our dairy industry. Uh, and that we're, we're kind of separating this. Okay, there's immigration issues uh, that involve the INS uh, and there are Vermont policy issues that in this instance, and for the stimulus payments, we wanted to extend that to them and we want to extend this health benefit. But in fact, if you, if you don't, if you make a completely tight linkage, um, it, def it basically puts everyone in the position of, I can't seek any of these services because in fact, if my information is provided knowingly or inadvertently uh, in an instance where someone may very well have a status that does not allow them to be quote legally in Vermont, but we in fact know they're here and know they're working, uh, that, that no one will understandably uh, avail themselves of any of the services. So it is, it is a paradox and it's a dilemma. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 I think the governor has uh, has agreed, and the attorney general. I, I maybe I, I may be stepping beyond what I should say, but that this is a narrow uh, way of navigating between the the federal government regulations and what the state intends to do for people who we believe are here uh, and should not have to live in fear of. Not, of not accessing a service we believe they deserve. It, it's, it's difficult, there's no question about it. And I hear your question and uh, there are probably others who can help articulate it better than I just did. Can I, can I give one example real quick? I'm sorry? Can I give one example real quick, which is sure, really, don't forget like these children, they're in our schools. So, you know, they're, they're already in school. So they have to have this, this confidence that by bringing your child to school, you're not gonna report them to the feds. So yeah. I mean, we already have these things in place. Okay, I, you know, I get all that, but you know, it, we, we have laws in this country, we have rules in this country and we continually step around them. That's all I'll say. I mean, I, I, I you, get you it. May not, you may not find a level of comfort sufficient to support this art. I reckon, and I, I just, I, I will acknowledge that there are those who do not, but yep. it has been the uh, policy of the legislature and of the executive branch to provide certain access, provide access to certain services while trying to preserve that barrier from automatic provision of information that would uh, jeopardize someone's uh, ability to continue to work in Vermont. It's, 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 there's, there's nothing easy about it. Okay. Thank you. Ian, or Representative Donahue. Oh, I'm sorry. That was an old hand. Okay. Sorry. It's, uh, they don't show up anymore when we're on. I would, I would never call you an old hand. <laughs> Someone with great, great knowledge and years of experience, but not an old hand. Okay. Uh, 
I have one other question, uh, Jen, and uh, I'm trying to check the time because I want to respect your, uh, I, I don't know, I, I can't see the time, let me. We're good, it's 2.06. I, I think we're good still. Uh, but you. You, you, you need to make sure you let us know when, because you have a hard stop, I know, and there's now snow on the ground. Oh, and I'm looking outside and it's coming down more and more. Uh, okay. Um, I, I was, there were, you mentioned two different uh, suggestions that I know, uh, I think Senator Hardy uh, had at one point shared something and said she was looking at possible some changes and you mentioned two of them. There was a third and, and it actually touches on what an issue that is implicated in part of what I was just talking about. And maybe you can tell us if they looked at it or if they did not, but in the. They, they did and determined it wasn't necessary. So um, the, the issue was around right, agricultural workers uh, who are not seasonal, who are year right. round, like dairy farm workers who, right. whose responsibilities are year round. Um, there was a, a lack of understanding about whether that or she hadn't realized that that already fit within this main language of Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available. That the migrant worker piece was a clarification yes. that somebody who might not otherwise typically be considered a, a Vermont resident would be uh, included in that term, but that year round agricultural workers were easily covered already. By that language, okay. and that, that's a helpful clarification because I, when I first heard it, I, when I first saw it, I would, I, I thought, oh yes, that's an important thing to include. But you're right, the includes is not the definition of the what's in quotes, but it's an additional clarification. Is that is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. So agricultural workers would be included in the in the quote Vermont residents who have an immigration status for which Medicaid coverage is not available. Should exactly. They, should they fall within that category. Exactly. Because some do and some don't. Right. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Representative Page. Hey, yes, Jen, a uh, quick question. The verbiage that we have here uh, delineating um, the, the verbiage that we have here is it similar the laws here similar to surrounding states that allow this to occur is it basically the same I don't are you talking about the benefit itself or the language well the benefit and the language because we talked about this before you know we didn't want to have other um uh, individuals coming into Vermont and using this service um, because, well, because it would um, probably hurt our own systems here. I am didn't looking... We de didn't we determine that some of these benefits were already being granted in neighboring right, states? Right, right. Yes, that's right. what I'm getting at. That's my recollection. I'm trying to look look at my notes to and see. I'm, if... And I'm just wondering whether you know our verbiage here is, is, is similar to what other states are doing. Uh, that I don't know. I know that Diva had looked at some other states and then um, and so, then suggested so, this language. But so I that don't... when when somebody like Representative Peterson asks a question, you know, about legality issues, you know, state issues versus federal issues, is it pretty much the same? with other states surrounding Vermont? I don't think I can answer that without some research. So okay. I well, don't know what the language looks like. Okay, well, it doesn't matter, I'm just curious. Um, I, I, can I guess what I'm ask. saying I'm is- I'm working on an email to Diva right now. Okay, well, I, I guess what I'm questions. saying is, what we have here is no different than what other states, or what we're doing here is no different than what other states are doing, actually. Some other states. And I, Right, and I don't, I don't know that I can answer that definitively one way or the other, or how the benefits compare to those offered in other states, even to, to non-immigration uh, disqualified families. I mean, I think there are different benefits in different states. Thank you. Can, can I say one thing? Yes, please, yeah. Representative Black. So if, if you remember, um, if you are pregnant, 
under CHIP, you are eligible to be covered. There is a federal, federal CMS allows you, allows coverage. So the states that have expanded to include that coverage cover under just their regular programs. Um, it, Diva had said that they were not going to do that because the administrative burden to be able to apply for that federal match, they thought would be more onerous than just covering them under state only dollars. That's right. And that's why, you know, that's why I think they want this language. Children, children are different. Um, that, that's only state only. Um, I know New York covers children and they cut and they say they cover them under their whatever their term for their child state health coverage is. I can't remember the name of it. Be New York's version of Dr. Dinosaur. Um, but then also I won't, don't forget, we have Vermont residents. So you can't live in New Hampshire, drive over the border and get this coverage. You, you still have to be a resident in our language. Okay. Other questions or comments? And again, this is language that's actually under consideration in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. We do not have jurisdiction of the bill yet. And they are, they are in the midst of their deliberations. Uh, but uh, I guess what I'm looking for, and we'll hear other questions or comments, but I think Senator Lyons is looking for a general sense from our committee as to whether um, this conforms to what we had in mind uh, as we sent the bill to the Senate. Uh, Representative Page? Yes, I, just, just a quick comment. I was just thinking what uh, Representative Black said about DIVA um, not wanting to I guess, include this language because they figured it would be too onerous to you know, submit the paperwork if I understand this properly. But it just seems to me, hey folks, you know, why can't you submit the, the paperwork and, 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 and do the necessary work to cover this? It just, that's all I have to say. Is so I do think the coverage is more limited in what we could, you can get federal CHIP funding to provide prenatal care, but I think it's limited specifically to the pregnancy related care and not to, so this provides uh, healthcare generally to pregnant individual and postpartum. It's not specific to um, prenatal care only. Well, look, I, I'm for this. I'm just, I'm just making the comment that Hey, you've got probably dozens and dozens of personnel working in that office, you know, and um, people should be, you know, well, I'll just leave it at that, you know. I, I hope I get my point across. I just feel that uh, there are things that our state government workers, workforce should be doing, our, our departments should be doing. And, right. um, and even if it is onerous, too damn bad. You know, well, go ahead and I, submit well, the paperwork. I am going to step in here, Representative Page, because in fact, uh, it has been communicated to me that in fact, uh, given all the changes that are happening uh, at the federal level in terms of the new premium assistance, et cetera, that, uh, that in fact, uh, the staff at DIVA are, and, and all that has been having to be done during the period of the pandemic, because they've also been engaged in providing uh, extended coverage uh, that, in fact, I, I think we may not appreciate the level of uh, extended work that has been required and is being required. So I'll just. Uh, okay, just, thank you, just, Chair. Just, and just, may, I make it, may I make a clarifying comment as well? I think it was not that they did not want to do the paperwork or, or put in the effort, but rather that um, it would be potentially or likely less expensive overall for the state to pursue this option to provide the coverage with state only dollars than it would be to uh, administer the program 
and get federal matching funds. So it was actually more cost effective to go this route than to file the paperwork or whatever the administrative work was to get potentially a lesser benefit. Okay, well then I take back my ranting and raving that I said earlier. Yeah, I, I yeah. Can, can I clarify something that Jen had said also that I had forgotten about? Please. Um, the, the, federal, the federal match is because they are recognizing that they're covering only the unborn child, which is why it's only for prenatal care. So if a pregnant woman was to get sick and needed to go to the doctor, there's no coverage for that. So I, in, in, you know, Diva wanted to expand it just so that they didn't have issues around like that. I think they are actively working as partners and trying to make this happen. Yeah. Representative Goldman. I think that was my question, which was better for the population of people we were talking about, which process and my impression was that Diva was working for them, you know, for our, the, the people who we were trying to help. So that was my understanding. I just want to verify that that was the motivation. Yes. And I think that's important. I think it's very important. Okay, um, other questions? So can you take down the, can you take down the, the language just so I can have us all on screen? Um, so I, I'm not gonna ask us to do a straw poll or, or a vote at this point because we don't really have anything in front of us to do that with, but I do, I guess I'm generally wanting to get a sense of the committee as to to communicate with our Senate counterparts that, um, okay, I guess what I'm, uh, let me put it out this way. I do not see anything in front of us that would suggest that this flies in the face of our intent or our desire to move forward with this, uh, what was an important bill and which our, which our committee supported very strongly. Is that fair to say? Is that, I'm looking across the screen that this, this is consistent with our intent uh, and that we appreciate uh, that the language uh, being changed in the Senate uh, uh, moves in the direction that we wish, we wish to go. Okay, seeing a lot of nodding on the screen, I'm going to convey that informally or formally in whatever manner uh, to Sec Senator Lyons and I would, Jen, I would ask you to, that you feel free to convey that as well in your interactions with the Senate Health and Welfare Committee that we appreciate. And I want to say, particularly to you and the folks at DIVA, that I greatly appreciate the hard work to try to make this happen, uh, because this, in fact, is one more thing that we're asking their staff to take on that uh, is in addition to the work they're already undertaking on our behalf. So and if you'd communicate with Senator Lyons, I'd appreciate it, and I will as well. Good. I think we've gotten, a, a gotten a, we covered some good ground here this afternoon, and I anticipate we'll see uh, language hopefully coming back from the Senate that's somewhat similar and perhaps modified slightly, but then we'll review it again. This will not be our last attempt to, our last opportunity to look at this. Again, just in terms of process for those who, this is your first time through, uh, the Senate Health and Welfare Committee will make a recommendation. Uh, they'll vote out some new language. They'll amend what we've done. It'll go to the Senate floor there's always the potential for an amendment there as well. And when it leaves the Senate floor, it will come back and be referred to the House because it is different from what we sent to them. And that will be the opportunity then for our committee to weigh in, to look at their final modified language and for us to determine whether there's any further amendment that we wish to make or whether we concur with their amendment. This review puts us in the position of perhaps uh, being much closer to being able to concur with an amendment from the Senate because we've already had a chance to understand it. Okay. Excellent. Uh, I think that's uh, this is a good use of our time. Jen, thank you for making yourself available to us. I think we can sure, thank you. We can leave you free Great. to uh, meet your other commitment. And I think with that, I'm going to suggest that we conclude for the day as a committee. Uh, 
I'm going to, and Mari, maybe you and I could touch base about what we talked about this morning. And I think there's some other things that people need to do to prepare for testimony tomorrow morning, uh, which will begin at nine o'clock. Okay.